uh, subcommittee chair, uh, Mr. Paul, and uh, also acknowledge that he has announced that uh, at the end of this term he will be leaving Congress, and uh, I'm sure that that came as quite a disappointment to the Federal Reserve. So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if you would yield briefly, can I join? Because Mr. Paul and I have worked uh, yes. in opposition on some issues, together on some others. He has been an extraordinarily valuable member, and I will, uh, I will miss him. And can I also note, Mr. Chairman, that you have the honor of, I think, presiding for the first time in American history over a committee that has three declared presidential candidates. So I hope we won't <laughs> soon have to have Secret Service replacing our Capitol policeman at the door. But I, I will miss Mr. Paul. And uh, one of them is here today. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. I, Mr. I thank Paul. the chairman for yielding. And somebody had told me that that announcement would put a smile on Chairman Bernanke's face. <laughs> <laughs> And his staff, they're all fine. <laughs> but, but I thank the chairman for yielding and uh, welcome uh, Chairman Bernanke. You know, the um, country today has uh, uh, become very much aware of how serious our problems are. I, I think everybody uh, understands that it's, it's very, very serious, it's, it's critical. And from my viewpoint, I think the country is literally bankrupt and we're not quite willing to admit that. But uh, uh, these are overwhelming problems that we do face. And unfortunately, from my viewpoint, I, I think we have uh, more going on here on who to blame for the problems and uh, who, who's going to benefit uh, by blaming. I see it a little bit differently because I see it as a failed policy, a policy of central economic planning. And that hasn't been going on just with this Congress or this president, but it's been going on for quite a few decades. And I think that's what we have to address. Uh, literally, the Congress appropriates the money and is a big blame. But also the special interests have tremendous influence and they're to blame. But also we have citizens groups who always want handouts and special benefits. They have some blame to assume as well. But also it's these uh, wars that continue to go on, the undeclared war, the constant wars. Nobody can even tell us exactly how many wars we're in today and when the next one's gonna start or when the last one's gonna end. And then all of this spending and pressure, then we also have the Fed to deal with with too. And I see the Fed as a problem because I see so much of this other spending wouldn't have gotten out of hand if we didn't have a monetary system where the system provides the funds. We don't have to be responsible because we can always say, well, it's up to the Fed. You know, if, if we didn't have the Fed buying up our debt, interest rates would rise and everybody would yell and scream. But you know what it would do? It would put pressure on us here in the Congress to do something about it. But I see the monetary system and the Federal Reserve System as a facilitator for all these special interests. And for a good many decades, we've been able to get away with this. And, but we're not getting away with it anymore because we've run out of steam. We've run out of jobs. We've run out of productive capacity. Our tax code is all out of whack. The entitlements are out of control. Our good jobs are going overseas. We chase capital away. We have a, deliberately, a deliberate policy of a weak currency. Weak currency chases away capital. So I see this has all added up to give us this crisis, and unfortunately, we're still looking who to blame for this. Well, you, have to, you can't find one individual or one administration. You have to blame the policy. And unfortunately, central economic planning, whether of the Soviet style or whether of the style of the interventionists, where we do it through congressional activity as well as central banking, uh, the central economic planning is always flawed because it's never as smart as the market. That is why I object to the, uh, the idea that we are knowledgeable enough to set interest rates and know what the money supply should be because that is information that should come from the market. When it doesn't come from the market, it's a failed policy and leads to the type of crisis that we are now suffering from. You know, we, we hear that in the future we're going to have a better economy and everybody hopes so, but it's, it's hard to believe, it's hard, to, uh, it's hard for me to believe anyway because I look at back on our past three years and uh, what Congress has done and what the Fed has done, we've literally injected uh, uh, about $5.3 trillion. And I don't think we got very much for it. The national debt went up $5.1 trillion. Real GDP grew less than uh, 1%. 
So I, I don't think we've gotten a whole lot. Unemployment really hasn't recovered. We still have uh, seven million people uh, that have become unemployed. And uh, one statistic that is very glaring, if you look at the chart, is how long people are unemployed. The average time used to be 17 weeks. Now it's nearly 40 weeks they stay unemployed. So nothing there reassures me. And also, um, when, when we talk about prices, we're always reassured there's not all that much inflation. And, uh, and we're told that they might start calculating inflation differently with a new, new CPI. Of course, we changed our CPI a few years back. There's still a free market group that calculates the CPI uh, the old-fashioned way, and they come up with a figure, in spite of all this weak economy, that prices have gone up 35 percent, 9.4 percent every year. And, and I think if you just went out and talked to the average housewife, she'd probably believe the, the, the 9 percent rather than saying that it's only, only 2 percent. So I would say what we've been doing it isn't uh, very reassuring with, uh, with all this money expenditure. But my question is related to the overall policy. Uh, spending all this money uh, hasn't helped, and yet many allies uh, that would endorse so much of what's been going on, whether it's the Fed or the Congress, they, they recognize that consumer spending is very, very important. And, uh, and they concentrate on that. But the $5.1 trillion didn't go to the consumers. It went to buying bad assets. It went to bailing out banks. It went to bailing out uh, big companies. And lo and behold, uh, the consumer didn't end up getting this. They lost their job, and they lost their houses and mortgages, and they're still in trouble. But my question is, if you took that $5.1 trillion and said that consumer spending is good, you could have given every single person in this country $17,000. Why, why is it the program of both the Congress and the Fed to direct the money to the people who had been making a lot of money instead to the people who, if you argue that the consumer needs to spend the money, I obviously don't advocate this, but I would suggest you know, maybe it could have worked better. It couldn't have worked any worse. But what, what is the reason we direct it toward the banks and the big corporations, too big to fail, and we don't pay that much attention to the consumer if it's true, and I don't know if you agree with that or not, that consumer spending is an important issue? Well, it is an important issue, uh, Congressman. Um, but you're, you're mistaken in saying that the Federal Reserve has spent any money. Um, you say $5 trillion. We have lent money. We have purchased securities. That's not buying, that's not dissipating, you know, the money. We've gotten all the money back. Um, as an article over the weekend by Alan Sloan showed, in fact, uh, the Fed has been a major profit center for the U.S. government. We've turned over profits in the last two years of $125 billion. So we are not costing any money in terms of uh, budget deficits or anything like that. In terms of what we were trying to do, of course, the, one, the reason the Federal Reserve was founded a century ago was to try to address the problems arising from financial panics, which did, by the way, occur in an unregulated environment in the 19th century. Um, we provided liquidity and short-term loans to help financial systems stabilize. We did that not because we particularly care about the managers or the uh, shareholders of financial I, firms. I, I, I hate to interrupt, but my time is about up. But I would like to suggest that you say it's not spending money. Well, it's money out of thin air. You put it into the market and you hold assets, and the assets aren't, you know, they, they are diminishing in value when you buy, buy a bad assets. But very quickly, if you could answer another question, because I'm curious about this. You know, the price of gold today is uh, $1,580. The dollar during these last three years was devalued almost 50%. When you wake up in the morning, do you care about the price of gold? Well, I pay attention to the price of gold, but I think it reflects a lot of things. It reflects uh, global uncertainties. I think people are, the reason people hold gold is as a protection against what we call tail risk, really, really bad outcomes. And to the extent that the last few years have made people more worried about the potential of a major crisis, then they have gold as a protection. Do you, th do you think gold is money? No. It's not money. It's Even a, it's if it has been metal. money for 6,000 years, somebody reversed that and eliminated that economic law? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's an asset. I mean, it's the same, would you say treasury bills are money? I don't think they're money well, either, do, but they're financial assets. Why asset. do central banks hold it? Well, it's, it's a form money. of reserves. The why don't they hold diamonds? Well, it's tradition, long-term <laughs> tradition. Well, some people still think it's money. I yield back, my time is up. Thank you, thank you. Um, 